All right. Now I found this via the JVC website. Uh, yeah, I'm not even halfway done here. I'm gonna take my time. I'm gonna show you everything. So this is the DMJV600U. Uh, it does say archived because it's no longer sold. These these machines, they're uh, like I told you, they're they're garbage. They're junk. I mean, unless you consider them to be historic, there really is no way to, no reason to use these machines. So this was archived. Uh, right here it says Discon discontinued model. Y yes, they have been discontinued. You can't really go ahead and buy these in the brand new state anymore. You can, I mean, you can still buy, find these on eBay, for example. Uh, which is what I did. I found these via eBay. I am going to tell you how, what I paid for these machines in a bit. Okay, this right here. This gives a lot of wonderful information regarding this uh, HDTV encoder. Okay. Notice right here. It says with 422 processing. Okay. So that's the color space that I told you about that the Pro HD format is able to record. Believe it or not, the Pro HD format is able to record a 422 color spectrum. Now, compared to nowadays, 2021, we, we really don't use the 422 color spectrum anymore. We mostly use the 444. But uh, considering the fact that these are, uh, these are VHS technically, they're part of VHS, to know that a VHS format was able to record a 422 color spectrum is quite impressive. Uh, now I have compared both the 422 color spectrum against the 420. And I mean, at least to my eyes, I mean, I'm 39 years old. And like I told you, I don't consider myself a video file. I mean, at least to me, I don't really see the difference. I mean, I can go either way. I mean, I can record both 420 or 422. And I, I, I mean, at least to me, it's the same thing. I don't really see a difference. Okay, so this encoder, it does have an option to choose either 422 or 420. It also, it encodes anywhere between nine megabits up to 45 megabits. Now, 45 megabits, that's a whole lot of data, like I told you before. Uh, the the Pro HD format is not able to record 45 megabits. It's way too much. Like I told you, it's only able to record up to 25 megabits. All right. Uh, let me go ahead and show you this right here. Now, this is from a modern day uh, professional machine store. It's from the broadcaststore.com website. Now, they do have these machines being sold right now. Now, right here is showing you the price for it. Okay, okay. now this is, this is quite interesting. Now, they do have a machine right now being sold for $31,364.75. Or you can opt, on, opt in for their payment options where you pay $1,006.18 a month. Now that's a whole lot of money. Now, like I told you, this hobby is not, not a very cheap hobby. It's expensive. But at least to me, I'm really not willing to pay $31,364.75. I mean, no way. I mean, I'm... I, I work in the electrical field, so I don't really win that, met, that much kind of money to blow on such a hobby. Uh, so I did fi find this encoder on eBay back in March of this year, 2021, March 30th. Now I found it for $100. So you do better believe me that I bought this right away. I didn't even think about it. I mean, that's a amazing price. $100 with $16.52 shipping. That's what I pay for this encoder. And it works, it works perfectly. So that's a huge difference between what I paid and what you can go ahead and pay if you wanna go ahead and buy this via a professional um, broadcast store in the here and now. Uh, actually, 
I've noticed that a lot of sellers on eBay, they don't really know what they're selling. I mean, <laughs> this encoder is worth a lot more money than $100. Um, now, I did put a good review for the seller. I mean, I, I did my best. I, I gave him a good review. I let him know that I'm a very happy owner of this machine. I let him know that it works perfectly. All right. All right. Now, this is a brochure for the encoder. Okay, uh, like I told you, JVC, they did a wonderful job on these brochures. It looks a very professional, very nice looking. This kind of swirl here really lets you focus on the machine itself. They did a wonderful job here. Let me kind of go ahead and uh, show you these highlights that I made, which uh, I don't want to read this whole thing. So I just want to show you what, what I consider to be uh, interesting regarding this encoder. So right away, the profile that it's able to record, it's a re to record in 420 or 422, which is wonderful to know. The bit rate, uh, it, it goes from between nine and 45 megabits per second. Now, when I create Pro HD recordings, I actually use the 25 megabit per second because that's the maximum uh, bit rate that the Pro HD is able to record. Now, delay. There is a 19 frame delay if you record in 1080i, and there's a 38 frame delay if you record in 720p. Now, you have to consider that this machine uh, is quite old. It's from 2004, so it's not very instant. It, it takes a while for it to process. Uh, it takes 19 frames in 1080i, and it takes 38 frames. So there is a delay, which I really don't mind. I mean. It's fine, with me it's fine. Uh, I highlighted the, the audio specs. It's able to process stereo between 128 kilobits per second up to 384 kilobits per second, which is, uh, like I told you, I'm not really an audiophile, so 128 is more than enough for me. That's actually what I use when I record in the Pro HD format. I use the 128 kilobits per second option. Uh, sampling rate. Okay, this is interesting. It's able to process a 48 kilohertz signal, but the Pro HD machines are not able to record for 48 kilohertz. They're only able to record uh, 20 kilohertz. So I have to tone that down for sure when I use this machine. Uh, the interface, it uses the SMPTE292M. Like I told you, I don't even know what that means because I, like I told you, I'm not a professional. Uh, perhaps you know what all of this means. And that's technically an HDSDI signal being transferred via a BNC. Now, I don't own any BNC cables because uh, they're quite expensive and they're kind of hard to find. What I use, I use adapters that convert from the BNC connection to the more common RCA type. I've used these quite often and they work great. Uh, well, since I'm here, let me kind of let you know how I use this encoder in the here and now 2021. What I do is I use my computer. Now this is my computer right here. Now this is the uh, this is from the Alienware company, which is uh, actually Alienware has been around for a long time. It was actually purchased by Dell uh, a while back. But I love the fact that they continue with the that styling that they used to have back in the days. This is the uh, M17 R3. Beautiful machine. I love this machine. I I just bought this about a month ago. I love the fact that it has both, like I told you, I kind of deviate from the topic, but I'll, I do, do, um, I'll get back to it. I love the fact that it has both a Thunderbolt 3 connection as well as a graphics expansion system. I can actually connect uh, an external graphics card if I wish on this machine and I don't use lose that Thunderbolt 3 port. So I actually use this computer, this laptop, when I record on digital VHS tapes. I record uh, from Netflix, you know, from uh, Amazon Prime Video, stuff like that. I feed this right here. I bought this from eBay. Uh, 
I feed it an HDMI source from my computer and this actually outputs an HDSDI signal which I actually converted to RCA because I use RCA cables and I feed that right here. This is the input for this machine and that's how I am able to record onto these right here. Now I have made one recording. I do plan to show you that recording, not in this video because this video would be, I don't know how many hours long. I mean, I really get into this stuff. I do my best. I will, I do, I do plan to show you that video eventually, not in this video, because this video would be insanely long. Okay, so uh, another uh, interesting thing right here, the three to two aspect ratio pull down. Now I do use this, because to tell you the truth, I don't really like the widescreen format because of the fact that, um, I mostly record vintage sci-fi and horror films. And back in the days, back in the 90s, back in the 80s, when I watched those films on television, they weren't in a widescreen format. They were in a um, 4 to 3 aspect ratio. So when I use these machines, I, I really record in the 4 to 3 aspect ratio because that's the format that I remember viewing these films in. I don't really remember viewing them in the widescreen format. Okay, another interesting fact right here. This encoder right here consumes up to 100 watts, uh, which is fine. I mean, this is 100 watts is not that much. Uh, the weight. Now, this is this is crazy right here. This this encoder is very heavy. Uh, it's actually 10 kilograms, which technically is 22.04 uh, pounds, which is a uh, very heavy uh, encoder right here. And it's also very big, very long. Right here we have the specs. It's actually 26 inches deep by 19 wide by uh, 1 and 15 sixteenths of an inch tall, which is technically the 1U setup like I told you about, which I really don't like because the fans on this, they're insanely loud. Now I do plan to turn on these machines and let you hear how this sounds. This is insanely loud right here. All right. Now, I do have the manual for this. Now I had to download this manual from the internet. You can still find this online if you wish to download it. Uh, I went ahead and I filled in the, uh, the serial number for my machine. Uh, my machine serial number is uh, 12950064. I love having that right there. I tell you, not, there weren't many of these machines made because, I, I mean, there really was no reason for a consumer to own an HDTV encoder. I mean, there was, really was no reason. So these were only made for the television broadcast stations and the motion picture industry. All right. Okay, another interesting piece of information here. Uh, it says it uses a 1U EIA size. Uh, it was using a server rack, it probably in its own room because it was so loud. All right, okay, this is kind of like a setup. A suggested setup which I actually don't use I use I use a little bit different setup because of the fact that uh, we don't really own these machines right here it's it's uh, recommended to use an HDTV VTR uh, now it's not saying you it's not telling you what model because there was quite a few different models used um, the VTRs that were able to record an HDTV signal back in 2004, like I told you, they included the M2 format, the digital S format, the digital beta format, which was called DigiBeta. Um, so it's suggesting to use one of those machines. Now, I don't use those machines. I use my computer, like I told you. Uh, this is where the input comes in. It's an HDSDI signal. That comes in, and this is where it comes out. This is the output. It's an ASI. So from HDSDI in comes out an ASI signal out. And that is being fed into the recorder, which is the SRBDA300U right there. 
Like I told you, I used a little bit different setup. I used my computer along with this converter into this HDTV encoder, which is fed into my recorder. Uh, I remember seeing this page right here many years ago, and uh, I really wanted to be able to own such a setup. And it's uh, wonderful to know that I finally have this, and I'm very happy to show you this setup. Okay, it says right here, if there is interruption of input signal, video or audio signal may not output for about 20 seconds. Uh, this is because, like I told you, there is a delay. There's quite a few um, machines here, both uh, VTRs, uh, encoders, especially since I'm using this adapter here, this, this creates even more lag. So there's quite a bit of lag between uh, my computer and the actual recorder. Okay, uh, another interesting thing right here is the uh, recommendations for the cables. An HD-SDI input cable. It says it recommends to use less than 10 meters, which is technically 32 feet with 9.7 inches. Now, at 32 feet, is a quite a long run. So back in 2004, in the professional television broadcast stations and uh, uh, motion picture industry editing rooms, you would have this, this machine up to 32 feet away from this machine. Um, not in my case. I mean, I live in a little tiny studio, so I don't even, it's not even 32 feet long. So anyways, a nice little piece of information there. Okay, now, okay, here we go. This is something very interesting. Now, I've read about this online via forums. Back when, um, in 2004, this encoder, for example, is able to um, copyright its both video and audio. Now, I turned those off for sure because back in those days whenever the studios would turn these on you were not able to record those shows with your machines which was uh, very unfortunate i mean it would really suck to invest so much money on such a setup just to find out that you were not able to record your favorite shows because the television broadcast stations would turn on these two settings right here that would be the video copyright and the audio copyright